Good afternoon and welcome to the monthly Relo Andes webinars. My name is Rob O'Leary. We're coming to you live from the U.S. Embassy in Lima, Peru. Next to me is Lisa Wakefield and we also have Karina Garcia and we have Ricardo on the board here making sure that we're all copacetic and we're moving forward. Very lucky to have a special guest here to speak to us. Coming from Puebla, Mexico is Sarah Hendricks and she has some very interesting techniques that that you will find very useful in your classroom. So Sarah, please take it away. Hello everyone. I'm very happy to be here and talk to you today. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm currently an English language fellow. I'm living in Mexico and I'm teaching at a bilingual technical university. And I really enjoy teaching beginning English. And I've taught for 15 years in various countries such as Ecuador, South Korea, China, Japan, and the USA. And I got my master's degree in TESOL. And I hope to share with you today the things that I have learned and practiced through all these different countries and in the years that I've been teaching. You guys, Sarah has been a fellow for two cycles. Yes. So she's I've... done great work in Mexico. So thanks for all you've done for the teachers and students there. Oh, you're welcome. I'm so happy and I feel very lucky to be able to live here in Mexico and speak Spanish and eat, eat Mexican food every day. So I want us today to get students talking, okay? Let's begin with a poll. First, I wanna know a little bit about you. Can you please tell me what age are your students? Please tell me if they are elementary school students, middle school, high school, or university or adults. And we will share the results with you. Here it comes. Ah, look at that. 45%, Sarah. Very prescient of you. Oh, great. I'm a university teacher myself, but don't worry. These speaking activities will, will work for any age student. Let's continue. Now, I want to tell you, these activities are for students of any age, students of any level, classrooms with many resources, and for busy teachers. So as I talk to you about the activities, I'll tell you how you can adapt them for young learners or how you can adapt them for students who have a very high level or how you can adapt them if you don't have internet, if you don't have access to a printer, things like that. So all of these activities you can use in almost any classroom. And let me tell you about the goals of these activities. Speaking is such an important skill. The students, when they begin to study a language, you know, the reason we study a language is because we want to meet people. We want to talk to people. We want to learn about other cultures. So when students have the ability to speak and practice speaking, it really motivates them. They really enjoy themselves. The next goal, we want to allow students of different levels to challenge themselves. This is good for the classes where you might have 50 students in a class and they're all different levels and you think, how can I plan a lesson so that the low level students understand and the high level students aren't bored? Well, these activities will allow all of the students of different levels to work to their own ability and challenge themselves. The next goal is to review old material and preview upcoming material. And finally, have fun and enjoy studying English. This one is so important for me because I love teaching and I love when my students are having fun too. And I think that that is pretty common for all teachers. We don't become teachers because of the high salary, you know. We become teachers because we want to enjoy our job. And so with these activities, I think you can really have fun. And your students can really enjoy studying English. Yeah, that, that is um, a really important goal here. We want them to have fun while they are learning. So I'm going to talk today about three types of speaking activities. First, we have drills. Second, we have participation. And finally, we have performance. And you will use a different type of speaking activity based on a couple of different things. Based on what skills you want the students to practice, how much time you have, 
and how much creativity you want to allow the students. So let's talk first about drills. So drills is just when the students are speaking in unison, speaking together and repeating, okay? So the skill you're working on here might be pronunciation or grammar or vocabulary. And so the skill level that the students need is, is kind of low because often all they need to do is listen and repeat. So this, it does practice some parts of English, but it doesn't require any advanced skills. Drills are good when you only have a little bit of time. I advise using drills for five minutes or 10 minutes, maybe at the beginning of class to warm up, at the end of class if you have a little extra time, or maybe in the middle if the students are starting to get sleepy, but we just do drills for a short amount of time. And finally, creativity. Drills, there is no freedom of creativity for drills because everyone in the class is speaking together. Okay, so I will teach you today about two different drills. Let's talk about participation speaking activities. So in the participation speaking activities, you are practicing those English skills, grammar, vocabulary, listening, all of those sorts of things. But when you're doing a participation activity, you're also working on teamwork, on working together as a group, explaining, understanding. And these sorts of skills, learning to work in a group, <clears throat> these are very important for the student's future. And I always try to teach the students life skills um, in addition to the English skills. Participation activities take more time. Participation activities are for when you have maybe 15 to 25 minutes. So for, for me, that would be about half of a class. And finally, creativity. The students will have a lot more creativity depending on what type of participation speaking activity you're doing. Today, we'll talk about two participation activities. And finally, performance. When I say performance, I mean something like a role play, a presentation, a debate, these sorts of things. And so these require the most skills. Of course you need your English skills, your grammar, your pronunciation, all of that. But you also need public speaking skills. You need the skills to keep, um, to do a performance without being too nervous, how to manage your time, how to use improvisation when you are speaking. And these are all very important for the future for the students too. Performances take the most time. So they might take your entire class period of 45 minutes or 50 minutes or 60. And they allow the most creativity with the students. And I enjoy a lot, I want to give the students a lot of opportunity to practice being creative because that is so important in all of our futures. Being creative is a, is a skill that we need to practice and, um, and improve. Can okay. I just ask you a quick question? Um, okay. You say drills, participation, and performance. Is this the, uh, the order you go in in your class? Do you do all of them in one class period? Do you do only some of them? How, how does this work? These are not meant to be done in, in order or together. Of course they can be, but for me, I just, I look at my lesson and I might say, okay, today we're gonna do drills at the beginning and the end. Or tomorrow we're gonna do a participation activity. Or, oh, we're gonna practice role plays, a performance activity is gonna take the whole class. But you don't need to do, for example, first drills, then participation. Although you can, you can if okay. you want to, you can put them together, keep them apart, however you like to use them. Okay, very good, thank you. Yes, okay, so now I want to ask you, before I introduce the activities, poll number two. So what percent of class is spent on speaking activities? Please choose what percent of your time, zero to 15%, 15 to 30, 
30 to 45, and 45% or more of your time is spent on speaking activities. While we're waiting, uh, Sarah, how often do you find in Mexico that uh, teachers spend on speaking activities? Is it on the higher end or the lower end? I think it's on the lower end. I would say the maybe the average teacher might choose A. And it's because they they fear losing control of the class or the they don't think the students will participate or perhaps the students will make mistakes and they can't correct the students. So I might guess it's on the on the low end here in Mexico. And how, how much do you think in the United States as an ESL teacher? Do you see it differently? Like uh, people use more, teachers use more speaking activities? I think perhaps in the USA, I might guess most teachers would say B. All right, time to share those results. And let's take a look. Wow, 45% or more. Oh, no. 40%, right? No, the, actually the biggest one is 15 to 30%. So, and then the next biggest one is 30 to 30, 30 to 45% is a little bit behind that. But yeah, 15 to 30% are your results. So what do you okay. think of this, uh, Sarah? I think that is, that is a good amount to be spending on speaking time. Um, for my classes, I, I aim for 30 to 45%. I think that's a good amount because we are practicing speaking during that time but you know all of the skills they really go together so I might introduce new vocabulary and then we're practicing vocabulary through speaking or we might be listening to each other do a speaking activity and then I'm practicing listening to my classmate so I think 15 to 45 percent is just a very good range of time if we do it every day, that amount of time is great. So it doesn't have to be over 50%, 75%. Would that be too much? I might say that's a little too much um, because, I mean, there's so much to do in an English class. You want to give them time for reading. You want to give them time for writing, for um, listening practice, things outside of speaking. So I think 15 to 45% is just, is just perfect. Well, let's see what we have to offer uh, in way of speaking activities. Yes, now you have all that time to fill. Let's talk about how we're going to fill that time. So the first activity, and it's called Jazz Chant. You can find okay. on the internet many different places. The, the picture you will see takes you to just one of many websites that you can go to for uh, Jazz Chants. And what a jazz chant is, is it's some text and you, everyone will say it together as you clap or as you listen to music. So I have an example here on the next slide that we can look at. When it comes up, you, this jazz chant is practicing some, some vocabulary. These, those, this, that. It's practicing vocabulary in that way. It's also practicing the vocabulary of clothing, blue jeans, shirt, shoes, things like that. So what you would do is you would provide this text for the students and you can show it on the projector. If you have a projector, you can write it on the chalkboard. If you have a chalkboard, I like to write these on a big piece of paper and then save that paper from, from year to year or semester to semester, however you like to do it. And so I thought we could listen to this one. It's short. We can listen to it and get an idea of what a jazz chant is. Okay, so just in case we have some uh, technical issues, we'll be, we'll be aware of that. Okay. These are my blue jeans. Can you hear it okay? Yes, we can. That's okay. this red shirt? No. That brown shirt. Those are my shoes. These brown shoes? No, those black shoes. This is my jacket. That green jacket? No, this blue jacket. Okay, so I'm going to stop 
So the students enjoy listening to the, the little music. That's why they call it a jazz chant. And we would first, we would practice it together. We would listen a few times and then we would practice saying it. If you don't have speakers in your class, that's okay. You can just say it as the teacher and have the students repeat. And I actually, I like to use it without the music from time to time because you can change the speed to match your student's level. So if I was doing it without the speaker, I would clap along as I said it. I would do it something like this. That's my shirt. This red shirt, no, that brown shirt. Those are my shoes. So you can hear how I'm clapping along and I would have the students also clap and this helps keep us all together at the right speed. And then of course, as we do better, as we improve, I would speed it up and we would go even faster. And this can help your students build fluency and start to really hear the rhythm and the flow of authentic spoken English. So you can find these jazz pants on the internet. Um, and then also you can find on the handout that is attached to this lesson, there's a lot more information about jazz chants, where to find them, how to do them. So now we're gonna go to our next drill. I'm sorry, Sarah, we have a couple questions. Sure. Okay, uh, we have, I hope I say this name right, uh, Shimena uh, Singhines. Sorry about that, if I got that wrong. Uh, uh -huh. Asks if there's a difference between a regular chant and a jazz chant. Yes, the main thing that makes the jazz chant different is that first you can kind of make it into music or a song. Either you can listen to the little music or the song behind it, or when you're saying it, you kind of make it so it sounds like a little song. So I might do it like this. I might go, that's red shirt. So it's a little more musical than a normal chant. Otherwise, they are very similar. Okay, uh, second question. Before we go on, there is some technical difficulties. Uh, a second question is, do you use these with university students? That comes from Kayla Sanchez. Definitely. I definitely use these with university students. And my university students, they have many different levels. This example that I have here is for a, a beginning student, of course. But jazz chants can be very complex, and they can teach very difficult grammar. And you might think, oh, the university students, they don't want to do this. This is kids. But no, I go in, I have a positive attitude, I have a smile on my face, and I'm like, this is going to be fun, we're going to do this. And I have 100% of the time had a positive reaction from university students, from adults. So I definitely use this. With yeah, I think, you know, we just need to remember that English learners, a lot of the strategies we have work well for younger people. Um, high school age students and they're great for university students because like you've said people want to have fun learning English so it's appropriate to use at a university and it might take a little time for students to get used to it but once they do they'll really enjoy it. Yeah and might I add too I yeah, have some teachers in Ukraine that I worked with who still not only use them with uh, university students but they remember when they learned them years ago and this is like 5, 10, 15 years later so it still works. Sorry. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear it. So the next activity I want to talk to is called audio lingual. And this is another form of drill. What you do for this activity is you think about some I have two examples here. The first one says possessive pronouns. So I would write on the board, I do my homework. So then I would say I do my homework and I would gesture, I would point at the class. And then I say, he, and I point at the class. And the students have to change the sentence so that it matches the new grammar that I've told them to do. So they would say, he does his homework. And they're speaking together in chorus. And I might have the whole class do it together, 
or I might break the class into small groups or break the class in half or however you want to do it. But you point at each different group or at the class and you say, she, and then point. And they would say, she does her homework. They, they do their homework. So they're practicing this new grammar and they're thinking quickly and speaking together. So this is an example of a simple way we would do that. And of course you might change the sentence to, I ride my bike, I brush my teeth, and you could practice it a couple more times. Now if the students are working on count and non-count nouns, you can see an example of how we would do it on the slide. I would write on the board, I need to buy apple. And then the students have to think. Do I say some apple? Well, no, that's not right. A apple? No. An apple? An. So they need to think, is the noun count or non-count? And does the noun begin with a, with a vowel or not? So then I would say banana, and I gesture at the class or gesture at a group, and they say in unison, I need to buy a banana. Then I say ground beef, and I point at a different group, and they say, I need to buy some ground beef. Mm. I say food, and I point, and they say, I need to buy some food bag of potatoes, I need to buy a bag of potatoes. So the students have to, they're practicing listening, they're practicing vocabulary, they're practicing grammar and speaking through this drill. And this drill should go pretty fast. You want to have a list of things that you're going to say so that you can point very quickly and keep it very active and moving so the students are really thinking and speaking a lot. Because it's such a quick, fast activity, it's a very short activity. I usually do a drill like this for just five minutes of the class. And once the students understand how it works, they they pick up on it really quickly and you can say, okay guys, we're gonna practice this and you can begin it and finish it. It's very quick, five minutes, and it's a good practice. Would this be good to begin or end a class perhaps or do a transition? Yeah, I, would I like to begin a class with this. I like to have a list of these in my notebook. So if I finish class five minutes early, I can say, ah, yes, we'll do a real quick audio lingual exercise before we go. Or if we are doing some activity and we're going to change to a different activity, I might do this in between the two activities so that we can just come together as a class, do a quick drill, and then change to the next activity. All right, great. Actually, I have a couple questions. Um, Mario would like to know what kind of songs you can use for teenagers when doing jazz chants. Well, it, it kind of depends on the teenager's level. And if you go to the handout, on the handout you'll see there's a couple of different websites. And on those websites you will find jazz chants about many different things, about computers, about going to the dentist, about... Um, let's see, buying clothes. So you can choose by the topic that you think the teenagers might like. They might be interested in um, computers or in buying clothes, or you can just choose the level that the students are. This might be a little too easy, other ones might be too difficult. Um, so there's, there's a really wide variety of jazz chants that you can choose from that you think your students might like. And that's kind of the response I wrote to someone. Someone had a question about more advanced chants, chat, chants, but I think you just answered it, that there's different levels and um, simplicity versus diffi difficulty of those. And then one other question, what is your approach for songs? I mean, I'm thinking you go to the internet and look for ones that match the themes, as you said, or the topics. Yes. Um, well, I like to use music that matches the grammar because I think the students 
don't enjoy studying grammar. So I'm always trying to make grammar more fun. So I might look on the internet, songs practicing conditional or songs practicing past tense, things like that. There are so many different songs out there. One of the songs I like is if I had a minute to practice really difficult grammar in a really fun way. So let's move on. So we will finish with the drills, although of course there are many different types of drills. We'll only do those two. And then let's talk about some participation activities. So the first participation activity I want to talk about is the information gap. Yes, so on the speaking activities handout, you'll find lots of websites and resources where you can find many different information gaps. So this is just an example of an information two pages it's for two students. So your students get together and they have different pieces of paper. And it's called an information gap because one student doesn't have all the information. They have to ask the other student for the information. So you can see here on this example, this is about seeing a movie. At the top, there's an example dialogue. Do you feel like seeing a movie? Sure, what movie would you like to see? And then they talk about the movie. And then you can see on a sheet next to the little movie poster, Gigantic, it says location, synopsis, show times. And of course, person A doesn't have that information. So they are going to be using the dialogue at the top to ask questions to person B. And you can see the example here tells the students how to share the information. Now this one is a pretty advanced information gap. The students might need to be high level to understand the vocabulary and be able to do this sort of activity. But these information gaps, they come in all different levels. Even very beginning students can do information gaps like this. There are some about family. When you are studying simple vocabulary like brother and sister, there are information gaps like this. And there are information gaps that are even more difficult too. So if you go to the handout and you go to some of the websites, they will show you many different levels, many different topics. Sometimes they focus on new vocabulary. Sometimes they focus on a specific grammar. There are many different information gaps for you. Now, sometimes information gaps can be difficult because, for example, at my university, I have access to a printer, but I could never print 60 pieces of paper to give my students. So you have to think about how can I adapt this for my low technology classroom. So what I sometimes do when I have this is I would have the A sheet up on the projector screen. And then the students, they are in their partners, with their partners, and one student faces the screen and one student faces away from the screen so they can't see it. So in this way, they can still do the activity and they will be writing in their notebook, but I don't have to print all of the papers for them. Another way I could do this is I could simplify it a little bit and I could write it on the board or like I do with the jazz chants, I could write it on a big piece of paper and then save that paper to use again next semester, next semester, next semester. So you have a couple of different options for using in your class, whether you have the ability to print papers, whether you have a projector to show a screen like this, or whether you need to write it on the board or write it on a big piece of paper. You can do the information gaps. So we have just a couple quick questions, if we can. Um, yes. First is from uh, Alicia Juarez, 
Uh, it says information gap is for participation. Which which part of your presentation is that from? Yes, this is participation because the two students are participating together, and I think partner work is the is one of the best because it gives the most students the most opportunity to speak. So it gives all of the students get a lot of talk time when we're doing an activity like this. Okay, great. And it sounds like if they all use this, they'll be happy as a super clam. If that's correct. Definitely. Okay, good. Good. Okay, great. So we'll go to the next participation activity. This activity is called Jigsaw. So let's talk about how to do a jigsaw activity. If you look at this picture here of the little students with the puzzle pieces, this helps us explain how we do a jigsaw activity. There are six steps. Let's look at these steps. So first, step one, you will make groups of four to six students, okay? However, the division of your class works best, make groups of four to six students, okay? Step two, divide the day's lessons into segments. So for example, if you had five groups, you might have them studying USA holidays. And you might say, group one, you're studying Halloween. Group two, Christmas. Group three, Fourth of July and then Thanksgiving, and then New Year's Day. So each group has a focus. Step three, assign each group to research or study that topic. Give them time to think, read, ask each other questions, and practice teaching their topic. So you as the teacher have a lot of freedom in step three. You might give them a reading. So you might have to prepare a little in advance and say, okay, you are all going to read this information about Halloween. Or you could have them, and my students, they always have their cell phones. So you might say, okay, you've got some time. Look on your cell phones. Research on the internet about Halloween. Or if you're in a computer lab, you might schedule the computer lab for that day and say, Use the internet on these computers and research your topic. If you don't have access to the internet or you don't have the ability to print something in advance, you could just change the topic. And you could say, okay guys, we're gonna talk about sports. Group one, think about soccer. Group two, think about um, running. Group Three, think about tennis. And in this, with these topics, they don't need to research, but they are going to work together to think and share. Oh, let's think about what vocabulary we know. Let's think about how to explain this topic. So they are working on group work, working together for this. All right, and then step four. Step four, count off in each group by however many people are in that group. Then make new groups, all the ones together, twos together, etc. So this can be a little confusing for the students, so I always try to, to help them out to make it very clear. In the Halloween group, if there are five people, they count by one, two, three, four, five, and then the person who is number one from Halloween joins the person who is number one from Christmas, all the ones get together. So you can see for step five, now each group has an expert about each holiday. The students now teach their group and learn from their group about all of the topics. So if we look one more time at this jigsaw activity picture, you can see how the expert groups at the top are the same color. And then they're going to break into different groups in the bottom. So they are one from each group together. 
Sarah, okay. can I stop you for a second while you're pausing there? Um, Beatrice says, hey. have you ever used Hello. these activities with big classes? She has 75 students and she wants to know how she can work jigsaw and the other activities in classes of 75. Oh, wow, 75. Okay, if it was me, if I had 75 students, I might first break them into three groups. So we have 25, 25, 25. And then Great idea. within that group of 25, then you'll make five groups of five. Now this can be really hard because sometimes in these giant classes, the seating is very inconvenient for moving around or making groups. So you have to decide if your, if your classroom has the, the space to do an activity like this. Sometimes when there's 75 students, it's like an auditorium and it can be very hard for students to make a group where five students can sit together and look at each other or change their groups. But I think it can be done. You have to give them time. You have to explain the skills they're going to gain from this. Explain why you are having them do this so that they see all the skills they're learning, they see why it's important, and it will increase their motivation to participate and overcome some of the confusion or inconvenience. And if possible, sometimes even sending a group outside in the hallway is another option. I've done that around Peru, where I just take them outside because there's not enough room for everyone inside. So you could send a group of 25 maybe right outside the door to work. Yes, definitely. Are there any more questions before we go nope. on? We're okay. Good. All right. So then the final step, step six, is some sort of follow up. You want to hold the students responsible for what they have learned. Okay. So you might say, okay, students, now your homework is to write a five paragraphs about each holiday. So I'm sorry, five paragraphs, one paragraph about Halloween one about Christmas. So they are showing that they did learn from their classmates. Or you might say, okay, students, now we're going to take a quiz about all the different holidays. So you want the students to see that this is a legitimate, this is a real way that they can learn from each other. It's not only learning from the teacher, they can learn from each other. So that final step, Step six, follow-up is important. And let me tell you, having done Jigsaw many times, I want to tell you that the first time you do a Jigsaw, you might be a little disheartened because the students might be confused. The students might not participate as much as you want them to. It might be a little bit chaotic. So you might finish and think, oh my goodness, that class was so hard, I'm never doing it again. But don't think that. Because the next time, it will be much better. Now that the students understand what it is, how to do it, how they will be held responsible, they understand it. And they are learning so many important skills here. Skills about research, skills about summarizing, explaining understanding. These are the sorts of skills that they will definitely need and use their whole life and with all of their classes. So I think this is a very important speaking activity, even though it can be difficult. Uh, just before you go on, uh, I'll say I've used this in the past too, and the first time you do it, it's really tough. But once you do it yeah. two, three times, the students start to understand it, and it really is a good way for students to speak and share and let them be experts in something, and they don't have to have all the knowledge in their head at one time. It makes it a whole lot more interesting, I'd say. Oh, good. I'm glad that you had the same experience, so there we go. Okay, great. We're gonna move super fast through the final um, through the final type of activity, which is performance, because I know that we're 
the time is moving along. So the Thank final you. one is role play presentations. I'm not going to talk too much about how to do a role play, how to do a presentation, what are they? Because I think we all know how, how to do a role play. What is a role play? What is a presentation? But instead, what I want to talk about is some common mistakes that we make so that these really have a good impact on the student's English skills and level. So here are four, uh, three, I'm sorry, three, three extra things we need to do whenever we do a presentation or a performance or a role play. The first thing we need to do is we must teach presentation skills. Quite often I see teachers and they say, okay students, I want you to do a role play about visiting the doctor. And then they talk about the vocabulary and the grammar they might use. And then the students write their role play and they present it. But they haven't taught the students about presentation skills. Things like face the audience, speak loudly, memorize what you're going to say, or hold your paper down so your paper is not in front of your face. Don't laugh too much. Be confident. Students need to learn these presentation skills. The second one goes along with that. Allow students to practice multiple times in front of multiple audiences. So again, if we're telling our students, okay, make a role play about visiting the doctor, and then the students, they write it, quite often the students don't even practice it more than once. They might write it down, read through it once, and then perform it, and quite often it's not very good. But if we require the students to practice, okay, now everyone, it's practice time. Let's make groups of four, and you're going to practice it in front of two people, in front of three people. Require them to practice it, and they will do a much better performance. And finally, we want to avoid audience fatigue. Okay, if we are doing a role play or a presentation, let's just think about the math. Let's say we have 30 people in our class, 30 students. We say, okay, get in groups of three and make a role play. Well, that's 10 role plays. If each one is two minutes long, that's 20 minutes of role plays, not counting the time in between where they sit down and stand up and go up. So that is actually a big chunk of our class. And the audience can very quickly become bored and they're not paying attention and they're thinking, well, it's not my turn, uh, I don't need to worry about it. So we want to do two things. First, we want to make the audience involved in some way. We might say, Audience, students who are watching, you're going to give them their grade. I'm not giving them their grade today. You are. Or we might say, as you are doing your performance, please be prepared to ask three questions of the audience when you finish. And so the audience must be listening and prepared to answer these questions. Things like that. Another way to avoid audience fatigue is to not do all of the performances back to back on the same day. I like to say, okay, we're going to do your role plays, you're going to perform them, but we're gonna do three right now, we'll do three at the beginning of next class, we'll do three at the beginning of the next class. This can be a little difficult if a student is absent on one of those days or the students say, oh, I forgot my paper. I don't have my paper. But I think it's worth the difficulty to have three performances on each day so the audience doesn't get tired of watching their classmates. You don't want them to be falling asleep or not paying attention. You want them to be able to learn and listen to each other. So let me tell you really quick, these are general tips just anytime you are doing a speaking activity. I love them to be in there, whatever their first language is at this time, because if your student is low level and doesn't understand, well, then they can't participate. So I always let them talk to each other to make sure they understand. Second, always model or write phrases on the board like, 
Okay, let's start. I'll go first. It's your turn. What should I do? Yes, that's right. Well, let's ask another person. I'm confused. Let's ask the teacher. So you want to allow the students to stay in English mode. If they get confused and switch to maybe their first language is Spanish, Spanish, switch to Spanish, it can be hard to get them back into English. So I always put these on the board so that the students can ask questions and discuss things in English. Third, be prepared for your classroom to be loud and look like it's out of control. Next, always be walking around, observing, listening, and helping. And finally, always set a timer and then stick to it. It's very easy with participation and performance activities for the students to waste time at the beginning. And then when you say, okay, we're done, we need to move on, the students say, wait, 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 I'm not ready, I'm not ready. So I always set a timer and then I stick to it. The first time you might have students say, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. Well, then they should manage their time better. And the next time they will not waste so much time. Right, sounds good. Okay. What is one activity we discussed today that you will use in your next class? Will you use jazz chants, audio lingual method, information gap, or jigsaw? Which of these do you think you can use in your next class? I'm thinking, I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of jazz chants today. I, so I love the information gap activities. Those are one of my favorites. I think people will vote for audio lingual because it is so low prep and it can practice a concrete grammar activity. So I think people will say audio lingual. All right, we're gonna close the polls off right now and let's take a look at the results. Look at that, jigsaw. What? Wow. The jigsaw, I'm glad people like that because I think it's just, it's a really great activity. I'm surprised that audio lingual was so low. And jazz chants, and jazz, jazz chants. People let me down on the jazz chants. I think I think we have to re-vote sometime and see. <laughs> I think there was, the, the vote was spiked. All right, so. Sarah, thank you so much. You got a lot of compliments from people saying a great topic today and they really appreciated it. And these are great methods for them to try in their classes. So you did an amazing job. So thank you for your time. I think we say you've done yeoman's work, whatever that means. Uh, Sarah, do you have any more slides, I believe? Yes? Getting there. lots of thank you for the session. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot. Everyone um, is nope, loving just it. just the final. Oh, wonderful. I'm so glad. And thank you for participating. Thanks for the questions. This is where they can reach you, Sarah, if they have any questions. And by the way, we had people from Ecuador, someone named Lisa Pai, I believe. I think somewhat something like that. Uh, we had people from many different countries uh, ringing in to see what was going on. So that was great. Uh, as you know, we also have our EL programs. It's not ele electric light orchestra the elprograms.org to find more information you can find us on facebook you can find us uh that's our email address at the bottom and that will be rob and i's last webinar as last we will be departing well. peru the beginning of august and we have loved being here with you guys on these webinars so thank you everybody for well, joining us so thank you very much and thank you sarah for joining in thank you karina thank you ricardo uh for helping us out today nos vemos nos vemos Ciao.